call this regular meeting of the St. John Hudson USD 350 uh, to order. Um, and I'd like to welcome all the visitors this evening. It's good to see the gallery here this evening. Uh, before we get to um, the agenda and so forth, we a couple things that we'd like to do to start with. Could I have Mitch and Carol come forward? Get out of my comfy seat. <laughs> <laughs> out of your comfort zone for a little bit. Come forward. We have uh, wanted to do this for a long time and want to present this evening each of you with a plaque of appreciation. Take a look at that. Oh, that's neat. That is um, neat. Thank you. We appreciate the effort that you have put forth to serve this district in a volunteer uh, position. And for you, Carol, it was eight years, and I believe it's ten years for you, Mitch. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, we're very proud of the work that you gave the community and uh, for all that high salary that you drew to do that job. <laughs> uh, I know you'll dish it all back. But uh, anyway, thank you for your years of service, and we congratulate you for a job well done. Thank you. We thank the district for having us. Yeah. Now, does any of the other board members want to say anything? And we'll give you a moment to say your piece here if you want to say any other words. I have, I just have a little small presentation for the board. This is a little bit uh, unusual, but uh, the date on the back is wrong. I thought I was coming in August and I, it didn't work out. So. This is something from President Abraham Lincoln that I've always thought was really neat and it has something to do with kids. It says, uh, a child is a person who is going to carry on what you have started. He is going to sit where you are sitting. And when you are gone, attend those things uh, which you think are important. You may adopt all the policies that you please, but how they will be carried out depends on him. He will assume control of your cities, states, and nations. He is going to move in and take over our churches, schools, universities, and corporations. All your books are going to be judged, praised, and condemned by him. The fate of humanity is in his hands. Teach him well. I thought this would be nice maybe to put up in this drab boardroom. Thank you. Thanks for coming this evening so we can give Thank you. Thank Thanks for the cookies. I'd love to take a cookie. That's awesome. Just one. And we'll leave you to continue. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, additions or changes to the agenda? We have one addition, and that is uh, an item relate to a proposed memorial garden, and I would uh, ask that we do that after the first item we have on the agenda of the American Heart Association. Okay. <clears throat> I need a motion to approve the agenda. Mr. President, I move to approve the agenda. Second. We move and second to approve the agenda as amended there with the agenda uh, additions. All in favor, right hand. Opposed, same sign, 5-0. Uh, consent agenda items. We have minutes of the last meetings, which we had two, September the 19th and 23rd, as well as uh, financial statements and warrants. We were mailed, emailed um, some financial statements, as well as what's at your desk there this evening. Is that the complete cost of the volleyball system then? The 11,482? Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. There may have been, I think there were some installation costs. That was the system itself, right? But there was installation. Mr. President, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. And move and second it to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, right hand. Oh, same sign, 5 0. Patron comments? Sure, there are the patrons. Local to 
evening. Hearing none, we'll move on to the first item of business, and our first item this evening is the American Heart Association presentation. I'll turn that over to Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's my privilege uh, uh, to introduce Linda Henderson. Uh, she's the Youth Market Director uh, for American Heart Association. Um, the school district has, for a number of years, taken part in a uh, program called Jump Rope for Heart. Um, I know there's been some uh, questions about that uh, in some of our board discussions, so it would be good to have Linda come in. She can present a little bit about that. Um, and then also, uh, Ms. Friesen is here, who has worked with that program for probably most of those years, I would imagine. Yeah, we've done so, it for six years. Yeah. So, uh, at this time, uh, Linda Henderson, I think she has a presentation for us. Yes, well. I do. And, and I do have some information that I'll pass out to all of you. Extra so I think that in the audience would like that as well. As I said, I want to thank you for having me here today. Um, I am actually your neighbor down the street. Uh, I live in Marty and uh, have been with the American Heart Association um, in different capacities through the years. Uh, now serving as the Youth Market Director in 57 counties in the state of Kansas. So I get to see a lot of schools, I get to work with a lot of kids, I also get to work with a lot of great communities. And so I feel that's a real honor because I get to touch a lot of lives in that capacity. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what we as the American Heart Association do so you have a better understanding of why what we're doing is so important to all of you here in Stafford County and in St. John. So as you can see, the mission of the American Heart Association is building healthier lives free of cardiovascular disease. Now a number of years ago, our mission was fighting cardiovascular disease and stroke. We've actually changed that because we want to take a very much a proactive approach. We want to prepare people to live healthier lives. I'd much rather fix it on the front side than the back side. So that is why the change in our mission. Now let me tell you about sudden cardiac deaths and some of the facts that you're going to see. 325,000 coronary heart disease deaths occur out of hospital or in hospital in emergency departments annually. It's a lot of deaths across the United States. This year, 1.2 million Americans will have a first or repeated coronary attack. About 452,000 of those will die. And coronary heart disease is our nation's leading cause of death. Now, a lot of people think that's the leading cause of death of men, but they don't necessarily uh, associate that with women. It's, cardiovascular disease is also the number one cause of death with women. Every 33 seconds, someone dies of cardiovascular disease. When it comes to stroke, each year about 700,000 Americans will have a new or repeated stroke. Over 150,000 of them will die, making stroke the third leading cause of death. So unfortunately, we still rank one in three. Women account for 6 in 10 of the stroke deaths. So not only is heart disease the number one killer of women, stroke is also leading that with women as well. When it comes to high blood pressure, an estimated 72 million American adults age 20 and older have high blood pressure. I'm sure that each one of you know someone who has high blood pressure. It might even be yourself. High blood pressure is known as the silent killer. Because many people, if they don't know their numbers and they don't have their blood pressure checked on a regular basis, do not realize that they're at risk. Direct and indirect costs due to high blood pressure in 2008 was $69.4 billion, and that is with the B. Can, now, when we talk about children and cardiovascular issues, congenital heart defects are the number one birth defect in children, affecting nearly 36,000 babies each year. Of these, 9,200 require invasive treatment or die in the first year. Sudden cardiac deaths account for 19% of sudden deaths in children between the ages of 1 and 13. You know, you hear a lot, and we're not even talking about 1 to 13, but you hear about those kids that are out playing football and have the sudden cardiac death. It's all in there. In the U.S., more than 9 million children are considered overweight or obese. As I said, I work with uh, schools in 57 counties, and I can guarantee you I can walk into most of those schools, and I can count off one out of every three kids 
either obese or on the verge of obesity. And it does not matter if they're in a rural community or if they're more in a city setting. It is there. 61% of our children ages 9 to 13 have no physical activity in non-school hours. Now think about that. If they're not getting physical education in school, these kids aren't moving. And that's leading to our obesity rate. They're really good at this, but they aren't moving their bodies. And I applaud you guys, because here in St. John, with your school district, you guys are supporting the physical education department, and you are having regular PE every day. Hayes just went twice a day in most of their school, or twice a week in most of their schools this year. Um, we're starting to see more and more of that, so hang on to it. I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. 80% of adults who smoke begin before the age of 18. 80% of our smokers started before 18. Now that's a scary statistic when you think about smoking in the 50s it was cool. They know all the risk and they're still starting. We still have a lot of work to do. One out of every three children are obese in the United States. That means by the year 2015, 75% of Americans will be obese. That's not that far away. 20% of our first graders will become diabetics by the age of 10 as a result of childhood obesity. This could be the first generation in the history of the United States that does not outlive their parents. So childhood obesity is leading to heart disease and stroke, type 2 diabetes, and rising health care costs. One way or another, we're all going to pay for this. Now, you might say, well, it's not happening here in Stafford County. Cardiovascular disease is also, including stroke, is the leading cause of death in Kansas. If you open up your packet, and you're going to find a sheet that looks like this on the right-hand side. Turn it over. You'll see a map of Kansas. In 2008, these KDAG statistics showed that 37.5% of the deaths in Stafford County resulted from cardiovascular disease. It is affecting you guys here. And you can see that there are some counties that are even worse off. So, you may ask, what are we doing about it? How is the funding that you're helping to support coming back into Stafford County? Everybody wants to know that. So let me tell you. We have an advocacy group, a very strong grassroots advocacy group, as well as a state advocacy group that works to protect our health care in Kansas. So they led the fight for the Clean Indoor Air Act here in Kansas that was recently passed. And uh, that's just one of the things that they're working on. We also advocate to ensure food labels include the appropriate nutritional information to promote healthy choices. Now, if you go down to Dillon's in downtown and look around the shelves, you're going to find the Heart American Heart Association's Heart Check on the labels. And those are going to tell any individual going into the grocery store that that would be a heart healthy choice for them to make. The Healthy School Beverage Guidelines in Alliance Certification Program is another thing that we work with with the schools and with the beverage companies. Uh, a number of years ago that uh, was passed and you will see that in uh, elementary schools, you don't find the pop machines. Those empty calories, caffeine-loaded beverages are no longer there. They're very limited in junior high and high schools. And that's because we don't want to um, get those things in the hands of kids while they're still developing, they're still growing. And that, of course, leads directly to childhood obesity. We also are part of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids which is uh, raising tobacco taxes and defeating advertisements that are directed at children. Uh, the camel for uh, Salem's went away. He was directed for children. The Fit Kids Act. Also, you will find that in your packet of information. It's three down. Looks like this. The Fit Kids Act is actually a national uh, program act that we are working on at the national level. This act in, in the documentation you're going to find here uh, shows that kids that are physically fit do better academically. So if you want to raise your state assessment scores, get the kids moving. 
Have them get up during class and do a few jumping jacks, jog in place, push-ups, anything to get them moving, get that heart pumping. Kids that are physically fit do better academically. That's part of the Fit Kids Act that we're working on. We also develop uh, CPR and AEDs. There are other organizations that teach CPR and teach the use of the AEDs, but the scientific research in developing CPR and AEDs came directly from, through the American Heart Association and the research that we fund. We also are part of the Get With the Guidelines program, which is improving cardiac and stroke patient outcomes. We work directly with hospitals and EMS systems, both rural and in large communities, on making sure that they have the best practices in place for best patient outcomes. So that if you are picked up by your EMS, they know exactly what to do so that you can survive. And when you get to that hospital, they also have the best practices in place for the best outcome. We also are part of the research that advances surgical techniques and develops life-saving procedures, such as artificial valves, pacemakers, cardiac stents, heart transplants, blood pressure and cholesterol lowering drugs. Now, I don't know about you, but I know someone who's been affected by every one of those. Many of them in my own family. So it, it is affecting my, my family. It is affecting my friends. I think it's probably also someone you know here in Stafford County that has benefited from that research. Now let's talk about pediatric research because the kids are part of this too. In 2006-07, AHA spent over 36, 32.6 million nationwide on pediatric and diabetic research. In the Midwest affiliate alone, which is an 11 state affiliate, we funded 30, 53 pediatric and 21 research, diabetic research studies. Now you might ask, why diabetics? Diabet diabetes and heart disease are directly related because of the childhood obesity issue. So that is also part of our research efforts that we're currently working on. Now, how are we partnering with schools? If you pick the next thing in your packet, looks like this, shows some of the things that we're currently partnering with you on. First of all, we have the service learning programs, which are the Jump Rope for Heart and Hoops for Heart program. I'm going to go into more of that in a minute. But we also have My Life Check. Now, My Life Check is a program that allows you to go online, take a 10-minute assessment, and look at the key points uh, that affect your heart health. And you're going to find a bookmark that was at the very front. I don't know. That. Right there? Nope, this one. Right here. If you turn on the back side of that, you're going to see the seven factors that we're going to look at to develop your heart score. Now you can go, I'll go on there tonight and find out what your heart score is. This is a free assessment. It's something that we encourage schools to do as part of a staff wellness program. It's something that they can share then with the parents in the community that they would know their heart score. What happens is once you get your heart score, and let's say you don't know what your blood glucose level is, you might want to go ahead and um, just put not available. It'll still give you a heart score, and you're not. You don't have that. There you go. Um, and, and once you get your heart score, what it's going to do is it's going to tell you where your strength and where your weaknesses are at. And then it's going to tell you simple things that you can do to increase your heart score so that you have a better score. It's very simple things. It might be exercise 10 minutes more a day. It might be eating more fruits and vegetables. It might be stop smoking, which would be a biggie. So this is a simple assessment that we encourage everyone to do. Everyone should know what their heart score is and how they can improve that. The next one is Heart Power Online and Play 60 Challenge. These are educational tools that all of our teachers use. Heart Power Online is for grades kindergarten through eighth grade. There are worksheets, activity sheets, coloring sheets, lessons that teachers can access for free online that they can then incorporate into their own lesson plans, teaching kids about heart health and about staying healthy. Play 60 Challenge is something that we've partnered with the NFL on. And this is a much more in-depth program that is available uh, to schools if they want to take it on. Um, and, and it runs over a course of a period of time. And, and there's some great stuff in that, in that program. So we encourage schools to take a part of that. Be the Beat. Now, we teach the people CPR. But in today's society, a lot of people are very 
nervous when it comes to having to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR to someone who's a complete stranger who's gone down in front of them. Scientific research has now found that chest compression only CPR can be as effective as mouth-to-mouth -mouth plus chest compression. So what we're doing is we're teaching chest compression CPR to junior high and even into high school through the Be the Beat program. This is a computer-based program. It includes two lesson plans. It includes um, two quizzes, a video, interactive games that the kids can play. That is all a teaching tool for the teachers. And the kids will learn um, chest compression CPR through the program. And again, that's something that you guys can access tomorrow. Alliance for a Healthier Generation is something that we partnered with the William Clinton Foundation. This is another resource that the schools can use um, when trying to find out how they can make their schools healthier, how they can make their cafeterias healthier, how they can make their staff healthier. It will give you, you do an assessment on your school, it will give you a score on that, and then it will show you different ways that you can improve that. It's a very, it can, you can just take the tools from it and just use it that way, or you can get really involved and the William Clinton Foundation through the Alliance actually awards bronze, gold, silver, and, and platinum level awards based on school improvement through that program. And then Wear Red Day is a program that we have um, in the first, February, first Friday in February is Wear Red Day. And it's an educational program for women to make them understand that heart disease is the number one killer. Because as I said, women don't understand that. <laughs> And so, this is just a promotional tool, and it's something that if your school is, is wanting to promote that within your staff, typically staff, highly uh, number of them are going to be women, um, it's a great way to educate them. Plus, every one of your students has a mom, or a sister, or an aunt, or somebody that they can share this information with as well. One thing that just came out last week is a new video called um, just a little heart attack. This is probably the best video that I think we've ever done because it speaks directly to women and it's got some humor to it. So I'll just kind of set it up for you a little bit. It's just three minutes. It's on YouTube. Anybody can access it. But uh, mom's getting ready. She's got the chaos of the kids trying to get them out the door for school. She's trying to go to work and she's starting to exhibit the atypical symptoms of a heart attack, which is what women do. And through that process, um, she's not quite functioning the way she should. The kids are noticing it, but she's ignoring it because she's fine. She's all good. She's taking care of everybody else. As her son walks out the door, he hands her her cell phone, you know, the iPad or whatever, and it has the warning signs and symptoms of a heart attack. So she reluctantly calls 911 as she's laying on the floor. And she says, I'm sorry to bother you. But I might be having a heart attack. That's what we as women do. And so this speaks directly to them. And this is something that you guys could link to your school website to speak to the moms in the community out there to make them realize they've got to put themselves first. So let's talk a little bit about what Jump Rope for Heart is. Jump Rope for Heart is a service learning uh, program about education and action. By participating in Jump Rope for Heart Hoops for Heart, students learn about the importance of living a heart-healthy lifestyle while also learning to give back to their community by supporting the research and education that saves lives right here in Stafford County. <coughs> now, first and foremost, it's service, learning about education. So, let's think about that. We want every child to participate in the Jump Rope for Heart program as far as the activity goes. We want them to understand Exercising is fun. Exercising is helping their heart. Their heart has to last for a lifetime for them. And so we want them active. We want them learning those heart-healthy lessons. Now, they have a choice as to whether they want to participate in fundraising. It's a voluntary effort. So they're encouraged, of course, because they might want to help out a family member or friend. But they don't have to. We understand as the American Heart Association, some families have been affected by heart disease. And they're very passionate about supporting our cause. Others are passion lies somewhere else. And so that might be something else that they want to support. And we're fine with that. But we want all the kids to, to participate in the activity of jumping or shooting hoops, 
uh, whichever one that Cindy's working with them on, because it's that important for them to be a part of that. Also a part of that program comes these educational kits. I'll start that one around. In these educational kits, Cindy gets these each year. It comes with four posters each year, four new posters. This one's on eating healthy that she can put up. And these are just helping her reinforce the educational message. She's trying to teach every day to the, with the kids. And then, in here, she also gets the benefit of all of our educational information that we have available, including right there. Each one of these also has activities, and it tells her what grades they're geared for that she can also use in the classroom. So if she's looking for something new to use, a little fresh, she can certainly use from that resource as well. So um, with the program, we provide all of the necessary materials that she might need. That includes the envelopes. Um, there's a parent letter that goes home that just describes the program to the parents so they're aware of what's going on. Of course, every student likes a sticker, so we give them all stickers. And then you'll find the other bookmark in your packet. Whether they raise any money or not, no child walks away empty-handed. Every child will get one of our bookmarks. And on the flip side of that, you're going to see a child that they've helped, because that child has been affected by cardiovascular disease. The other things that Cindy gets with the program is every year um, we give her 12 jump ropes and a set of double dutch ropes because we understand the jump ropes break. <laughs> and so we need to replenish those. And, and we want to make sure that we're supporting your PE program as well. The other thing that happens is um, we also, because of the school has, is such an important partner to us, I give her samples of all the different thank you gifts that the kids can use. And she can use those however she wants. And she can use all of If you look at all of our programs, and you will see the two envelopes in there, and on the back side shows the thank you gifts uh, that we provide. Um, all of those are very interactive. We want the kids moving, so they're all movement-based, or, you know, going to uh, encourage that. So one is my favorite. It's number... Six on jump rope. It's called Cyber Fiber Fire. It is the coolest thing because there's these glasses you put on, and the picture is not accurate <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But the ball—it looks like the ball glows. It's fabulous for eye hand coordination because to, to watch the ball glow, they have to keep their eye on the ball. So it's, it's a great teaching tool. That one is. Um, the other thing that happens with the program is based on how much money the kids raise to support the work of the American Heart Association, we also pay back to the school. Um, based on how much your money is raised, you also earn U.S. gain certificates. And Cindy can choose to spend us however she wants uh, to then uh, replenish whatever she might need in her own PE program. Because we feel it's so important uh, that kids get a good PE program that we want uh, a way to uh, pay back that as well. So, what questions do you have for me? The program occurs in February. The program is flexible. I have schools that do it anywhere from now all the way through April of next year. That's the beauty of the program is, is we are not set that the program has to stay in one particular time frame. Um, some schools, I have some um, PE teachers, they coach. And so it's not really a good time frame for them to do a February or March event, so they'd much rather do an October event. And I work with them in that fashion. Okay, so where I'm going with it is okay. that is there a certain lead time that's required to make a commitment to participate in the program? Well, we um, ask schools to, to make that commitment um, in the spring of each year. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, last spring, St. John committed to the program for this, coming for this year. year. Mm -hmm. What other questions can you ask? I don't know. We've got some of this stuff at home. Okay. <laughs> so. Do your kids enjoy the program? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the messages we want kids to understand. And the nice thing with jump rope 
and, and even basketball is it's something they can do on their own. And, and they can and I know I have heard from countless teachers that tell me that when they start the program and the kids are jumping and they get excited and um, we, we provide resources so that teachers can teach basic intermediate and advanced uh, jump, jumping techniques so the kids can learn to advance their skills and, and they just go out and jump because it's so much fun and it's something they can do at their own skill level and they can have a lot of fun with it and, uh, and they can learn from it that way. And St. John has historically raised close to ten thousand right? dollars. It from year to year, Cindy. I can tell you that. I oh, right Cindy's here. got. All, Cindy got all that. Okay, we started out in two thousand and six, and we raised about four thousand nine hundred and seventy-eight. And our highest year was in two thousand nine, where the children brought in eight thousand seven hundred three dollars. The last two years, we've raised about six thousand, say eight hundred dollars. In six years, we've raised a total of $43,181.50, and that comes out in six years to an average of $7,196.91. And you guys are to be applauded for that. That is awesome. It really is. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I, I look at is if people didn't feel passionately about our program, they wouldn't support it the way that they do. Um, I would say that if people are giving it's because their lives have been touched by cardiovascular disease as well, or stroke. And I have, sorry. Go ahead. I have teachers that give me a flat amount, like especially down in the fifth and sixth grade area. They'll give me a check for two hundred dollars, and they will tell me to divide that between the fifth and sixth grade students. And so I make sure every student has some type of money turned in. I mean, I guess I don't. Those teachers do, because that is their donation that they want to give for that year to American Heart. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn Dixon knows firsthand a lot of those prizes I give, I give to the classroom teachers. I don't keep them myself because when I have 20 kids, it's hard to share one piece of equipment, so I give it to the classroom teachers to use in their playground equipment. And so, you know, that is spread around, and that I asked Linda if that was okay, and she said that's wonderful. I have AIDS every year, and she's nice enough. I give her the t-shirt size of the AIDS, and they're able to have free t-shirts. I figure if they're going to work with me, they need to have some reward. Mm -hmm. And the kids love the program. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And we really do. I mean, we're, I'm willing to, to work bend over backwards to help your school um, succeed, it would not only um, with our programs, but I also want to give back. That's why we partner with schools. And that's why we have all these other things that I want you guys to know about. I mean, I'm very passionate about that um, because we've got these great resources, and and you need to know about them so that you can put them to use, so that you know you can affect the lives of those here in your community. And I know Cindy does an excellent job about talking to these kids about what are risk factors, what are warning signs and symptoms, and hopefully they're taking those same messages home to their parents. And and if they should see a parent go down, or a grandparent go down, or start exhibiting the signs of stroke, they will recognize that, and they will know to call 911. I recently visited with a family in, in uh, Salina, and the 13-year-old son had been exposed to CPR, and sitting at the dinner table, dad went down with a massive heart attack, and he knew enough to start CPR, and his sister went and dialed 911. Well, I'm freaked out. <laughs> but he's alive today to still go and see his kids play sports and his daughter cheerleader at the, the high school game because they recognized and they knew what to do. And it's from these small lessons that keep coming into the schools that we're able to, to get them to understand how they can save a life too. We also have Sandy Lucas from Larner that comes and puts on a presentation for the kids here. It's kindergarten through sixth grade. And we take an afternoon, and she works with all my third and fourth graders. And if you want to see something that's awesome, with a group of kids, it's like joining an athletic team. And those kids have to put in hours. They have to have a certain grade point average. Mm -hmm. And if they miss so many practices, they're off the team. Yep. They come in and they perform. She works with my kids from 1230 to 115. And then those kids perform from 130 to 2 for the student body. And I think the teachers sitting here and myself can contest the simple fact that those kids love that assembly. And, and it is something to behold. And she puts, 
She sews each of the objects that there could win in this this uh, prize package that they could receive, and the kids love it. And last year, I challenged the kids to everybody bring in at least one pledge, and Mr. Losey would dress in purple. He agreed to that. <laughs> And they have pictures of it. No pressure there. <laughs> I've already I'm informed her she has to come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> and then when every, we, re we reached our goal, we got to take them swimming out at the lodge. And it was just something fun. Mm -hmm. And at recess time, those kids, where's jump rope, where's jump rope, got to try and do all those things. They were so excited. It really, she does a fantastic job with it because they really do get involved. Okay, good. good. So, yeah. And Sandy has been a volunteer of ours for probably over 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's how dedicated she is mm -hmm. to the program. And let me tell you, it's totally volunteer. She does not get paid for that at all. So. I would like to see a program that gets allowed to continue at the present rate that we're doing it. So, I'm sorry, I would. Yeah, I, and, and I know, you and I, we haven't had a chance to talk about it recently. Um, but we have a little bit. And it's not that I see this as a bad program at all, because I do see a lot of benefits, and, and I am not denying that, that cardiovascular health is an issue in our community, or, you know, in our society, but we could probably hear the same arguments for any number of health conditions or autism or, you know, environmental causes, you know, it, it, and I kind of question whether it is our school's responsibility to um, so actively advocate for a particular cause, especially when we struggle so much for funding locally in any number of causes anyway. And I look at that $45,000 and what we might have been able to do locally, and and that's, that's the mixed feelings I have about it. You know, we have a lot of fundraising that goes on for different things, and when we ask people in the community to give I, I feel like that we've kind of got to pick and choose and that in an environment where our funding is so strained, not only within the school but in civic causes and everything too, that we got to think twice about whether this is our highest priority. Um, I talked about the concept with um, some people that I work with at, at um, the local community foundation and they're very active in trying to um, you know, support local philanthropy and and um, and what people can can do to improve their own community, and had even offered to um, work with us to develop something where they would even match what we raised if we came up with a way of using it locally. And something that the kids helped define is something that would improve their community. So that's why I have mixed feelings about continuing it, but um, I respect so much all of what Ms. Friesen does. I know that you just go beyond and above in so many ways in your classroom, so I, I'm not at all um, wanting to undermine what you do um, because you're a great teacher and I, I respect um, very much when you, you talk about the benefits of a program, but there's my mixed feelings about it. And, and I hear what you're saying. I know that you know there are a lot of good programs out there, and, and a lot of things that could be done. Um, the one thing that does happen with this program is this is the only time in your community that the American Heart Association um, asks for your support. Um, we don't do any other fundraisers here in the community, so it's our only touch with your community that way. And, and I do feel very strongly that through this program, we are touching the lives of your kids. And when we t start talking about the rate of childhood obesity, let me tell you, it is scary up there. And, and if you think I, I'm exaggerating on the statistics of the year 2015 and 75% of the population obese, go walk down the street. And you're going to see it. It's there. We've got to get that education. And Cindy does a great job, and this is just one more step in making sure that the lives of our children are protected. And, you know, we can, we can fix it on the back side of it, but I'd much rather fix it on the front side and get them to live and understand the importance of heart healthy living, not only them, but their families. So. 
I, I, I would agree with you, um, and I've been around fundraising for quite some time. In fact, I had to deal with it for the last 30 some years. And, um, at the um, state level, our FFA association, every year chooses a, a uh, non-profit organization to team up with, like Make-A-Wish, or it could be American Heart or something, but to me, the service learning and the education that goes with this can't be matched. And I know that the problem is, is if, if we don't do it, who's going to raise the funds for something that's so important? And I think it's there's a middle of the road here that can be matched. I think having this tied in where, you know, it's it, it'd been nice to have something in conjunction that with the foundation or something here, but I think that she started something really good and the kids have buy into it and and a good education's happening with it. I can't see dropping it. I just have a hard time with that because I this is really good for our community to be educated. Uh, I, I would like to see some things on the website that people can link to right away, um, especially as, it, as you approach this uh, through Facebook, through our. Um, but, you know, I don't think the emphasis is to drain the community. I think the emphasis is to really educate them. And some but I think we could, I think we could accomplish them. those same kind of goals in a way that actually gets the kids more involved in the activity itself civically. Well, I think that's that's a total different picture altogether. Not I if think, you're talking about the benefit of I think uh, that's a whole other issue in that's... itself. Um, but I, I, I do think it ties into the physical education aspect of that people need all people need to be more physical, have more physical activity to help with their own physical well being. Did this start when uh, Mr. Losey had his heart fairly close to that, yes. Problem. Yes. Yeah. And he was an avid supporter of it, and he stood in front of the kids at one assembly and talked about why he felt it was so important. Yeah. Um, and my point to him was, did you call the American Heart Association, or did you call your local hospital when you had your heart attack? Well, I, I just had that question, and then I was just thinking that, you know, like, giving for anything, it's all voluntary. Mm -hmm. You either give or you don't. It's my choice on whether I want to do it. If I want to give to the Heart Association, I do. In, in, in a way, it's like you giving your money at church. Not all of it stays local. You're supporting missionaries and, and who knows what else all over the world. And so, I don't have problems with this at all. I will tell you, I have been approached by the Diabetic Society to hold a swim <coughs> or a jump rope or something along that line. And Mr. Losey said, no, we are supporting the American Heart Association. This is what we're doing, and this is what we agree to. If somebody else wants to do one for the diabetics, then they need to do that. But he says, here at the school, we're doing this one thing. And so, I mean, I've had other people approach me. But. Well, and, and to answer your question, when Mr. Lucy had his heart attack, I certainly hope he didn't call the American Heart Association. I hope he wanted to call 911. That's, that's my point. That's teach. my point. And but we're in a place because, where, you know, maintaining our hospital is an issue in, but because, in Stafford but County our, and our basic services. Right, but our research and, and information and, and the... The response information that your local EMS needs, we work with the state local, state EMS that, that disseminates this information, is all coming through the American Heart Association. So it is coming back to your community. And Mr. Leslie was here, thank goodness, because of that. We are very grateful for that, those lives that are touched. Well, 37% of Stafford County people away last year due to this. Um, we do do a lot of local fundraisers, mm -hmm. our kids, and uh, once in a while, I don't think it's bad to throw in a, something bigger than us type of thing like this, where uh, a lot of times we just focus on ourselves and our county. Just, so 
will round our kids, I believe we need to throw something in that's on a national scale to show them that you know, don't just focus on Stafford County all the time. Protect your own a lot, but once in a while, you got to look at what's out there. So, I would support the program. Is there any other questions that we can ask Linda this time? Appreciate her coming in and, and sharing this information and giving us the packet to look at. Yeah, and my card is in there if there are any other questions. Um, and you tell me how you want to get your, you know, who I should be in contact with to get this information on your website. I'd be happy to work with you on that. That would be wonderful. We'll, we'll that. that would be great. Would be One happy. last question I sure. have. Um, at what age does the American Heart Association recommend kids learn CPR? We start at junior high. That's where the Beat the Beat program starts. And, and let me tell you, it is a great program. Um, they're, they're learning uh, the videos on there. Like I said, two lesson plans, two quizzes. There's interactive games uh, that they can play. Um, but it, it shows them the fundamentals of doing the chest compressions. Gives It shows them how to do the correct rhythm, which is 100 beats per minute, which is pretty fast. Um, but it's to the song, say, well, Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> I won't sing it. It would be bad. <laughs> Stay alive. Anyway, um, and then it also shows them some things about the correct placement of an AED. Not that they would ever actually probably do it, but it does start educating them a little bit on that. So um, we, there's some, some really good stuff with that program. So um, I was trained on CPR when I was 15. I became an instructor shortly after that. So, you're never too young to save your life. <laughs> well, thank you, Linda, for thank you. coming over here and sharing us this information. Well, it was my pleasure, and I thank all of you. I think I learned something. Good. It was a great trip then. <laughs> I, I won't have that extra cookie now. Okay. <laughs> Next I'll tell you how much sugar's in your food. <laughs> hey, you need to eat it because of the brand, okay? The coconut's fruit. So right. I can have, I can double what I've consumed already. Well, I will tell you, all things in moderation, but eat the rainbow. <laughs> all right. Any further discussion on the Heart Association presentation on this information that we're going to We'll move on to the next item, which we have the uh, presentation about uh, Memorial Garden. Memorial Garden, yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Fon, and thank you, Linda, again for coming. Oh. Um, um, Teresa Miller had asked to come and speak to the board, and then I could give you a, a file there. It's on your desktop. It's uh, labeled Memorial Garden Proposal. Can you just back to me? Oh, well, if you would like to keep it, you certainly can. Um, and so, uh, Teresa Miller has been gracious enough to come to the board tonight. Um, do you have a file on your desktop? Uh, I guess so. Thank you, you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a sketch uh, of it. So uh, at this time, she said, if you want to come up and you can kind of give some background um, and between the two of us, we can help the board understand what this is. Linda worked for me as a para, and when the accident happened, some of us teachers wanted to do something lasting, so we kind of visited. And Linda loved flowers. Um, she talked a lot about her flowers. I know one time uh, she got very aggravated because the deer were coming right up to the house eating the flowers. So she made Jim build a, a little fence to protect them. So anyway, yeah, she, she loved gardening. She loved flowers. Um, so um, we had talked about, you know, the new building has very... It, doesn't, it has grass, it has nice grass, but no other shrubbery or, or flowers. Um, uh, on the east side, there is kind of a triangular section um, that um, we would like to use 
Greg Lewis, um, I did not realize this, but he has a degree in architectural design. That's what he did before he farmed. And so um, we visited with him, and he drew up uh, this sketch, and then Jim and uh, Greg and I met, and you know he discussed everything, what, what, all, what all of that means, different plants, different flowers, grasses. Um, one of my parents, Michelle Houston, has a mold for a concrete bench. We would like to put a concrete bench, a path, um, am I saying it right, trellis? Mm -hmm. And, and um, so that is the proposal. Uh, there has been some money earmarked specifically for the garden, and Jim and Kristen visited after you know this was presented. And he would very much like um, this to proceed. I tried to get a hold of Greg, but I know where Greg's at because my dad is a mm -hmm. farmer, and it's where you. You know, now it's planting time, it's harvest time, and and um, so I know that's you know what he is doing now. But um, you know, he knows what he's doing. We wanted somebody. We wanted to look nice, and somebody that knows what you know. And he does. I also, there is um, underground sprinkling. David Spare is the one that put it in. And I did visit with him. And he said he would be happy to come over if, you know, some of the sprinkler heads, you know, needed to be moved. So there is water, you know, access. And I know a concern is who's going to weed it. Um, as long as I'm here and I'm able to bend over, um, and my parents and I, you know, it's right out front our window, um, you know, we will. I also mentioned something to Jim, they were very active, you know, in their church and also their 4-H. 4-H is always looking, I was a member of 4-H for years and years, they're always looking for community projects and hopefully 4-H will be around for years and years and that's maybe something their 4-H group could, you know, be, be active in and so, um, you know, the proposal I hope it will all be put in. Um, you know, Jeffrey would have been a senior, and, and the senior class has also, they have asked some questions. They want, um, you know, something in memory of, of Jeffrey, too. And um, my husband, uh, Joel, you know, could mill just a nice little, you know, plaque that says in memory of um, Linda and Jeffrey. But that is the proposal. So throughout the rest of the school year, hopefully we'll get started and by, you know, into school, hopefully it's all in. And we're also doing different flowering plants. We'd like different flowers, some that, you know, start blooming in March throughout, you know, the spring and the summer. And Michelle Houston used to have a flower, you know, shop. So she she's very knowledgeable of flower and whereas Greg said, you know, he'd take care of the, the bushes and shrubs, things that come back, you know, year after year. Any questions? Yeah, I have several. I, it looks great. Good. Um, here's my question. I've been around education for too long, and I've been around memorials, and I, I'm just being not, I, I, I don't want to seem rude, no. but this is a, a very legitimate question. Three years down the road, or four years, you have a different board, you have different teachers, and the things run down, and you have people uptown saying, how come that's not kept up? What did we do? I've seen it happen time and time again on memorial things that are, are especially where there's shrubbery, uh, not a permanent item. And the other thing is it's the changing, the ever changing. I can see the bench up there because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. not much is going to happen other than vandalism to it. Hopefully, never, never. But with shrubbery, if it's not kept to the same ideal that you put it in in two years, how how do you foresee that being a long-term effect? I mean, I I think it's a great idea. I just wish you could keep the beautification of it forever, but you have different people, different maintenance people. Um, the memories of, of Jeffrey and Linda won't be the same in four years from now. 
as they are today. Good questions. That's why, you know, I, that's a concern, yeah, you, especially in front of a school building, you don't want it to look bad. And that's where I had brought up, uh, you know, the 4-H, and he, he thought that, you know, might be feasible. But, yeah, care of it is a, is a concern. To help everyone orient yourself on where this is, um, the east side of the early education building out here, if you're entering from the east toward the west, um, this kind of trapezoid area is just to the right of the entrance. It's really not a very big area. So. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And Greg thought it was good because, you know, it's surrounded by um, the concrete and you know, we'll kill what you know, we'll kill all the grass and they got a weed barrier and so there won't be anything that maintenance, you know, has to mow in there. Um, um, and I was hoping, you know, to get a hold of Greg to see, you know, uh, what kind of plants and and, uh, and how much, you know, how much maintenance, whether you know, I, I think of my own house, and, you know, once a year you cut the bushes down, and, you know, there is some, um, the things I have don't require a whole, whole lot of maintenance, and I think that's what he was, you know, looking towards, but, um, yeah, we all want it to look nice, um, so... You said you was going to be taking care of it until you could get down on your knees and everything. Yeah. So you're young, so that's Either quite that a few or years. I lose my mind, and that might happen before I can. <laughs> 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 well, um, but yeah. I mean, I, so there uh, is your. What kind of cost does the district have? None. Absolutely. None. Uh, and there's been some money earmarked for the garden. It's through all through the Education Foundation. And then, what, I think there was three different uh, memorial, you know, that Jim had set up. And um, he said the money, the money is there. Jim, Jim and I talked about that also. Yeah, so this... I, I, I'd like to honor him in the fact that you know we have a student, but we also had somebody that actively involved employed by the district. Um, I mean, it, it could be a very educational for for students, but um, we'll have that landscape design and core class. <laughs> right. I do know <laughs> that cool. the art teacher, um, Mrs. Binky, took a four-day class, and Norman Cooper was hoping to go. He teaches, you know, fifth and grade, uh, fifth and sixth grade science, and it was all on native um, grasses and plants and that kind of thing. She came back so excited, and there is big grant money for schools to put in, you know, natural gardens and. Um, you know, it, I know Norman plans to go, I know Mrs. Binky plans to go, and um, lots of schools, and so kids buy into it as part of the science, you know, classes that they take care of the, you know, the gardens that are, are planted. And I thought if that proceeds, which I really think, I mean, Mrs. Binky was very excited. Norman, Norman's got a real green thumb. He was, you know, excited about it. If we could get that, this could also, you know, be... If I'm not mistaken, a lot of the grants that are available have a bent toward the idea of healthy eating and gardening food. And I and, and actually the school nurse had mentioned to me some ideas on... Well, I don't think know, that's a garden. At, and I don't think that's what we're going no. for here yeah. at all. Is, no. there, no. is there money enough in the memorials to have where you could replace plants or provide a little bit of education, two to three hundred dollars, you think, additional? 
you have any idea? I don't, I don't think there's enough in what we have. I don't know what all the memorials are. Yeah, are you knowledgeable about that? Uh, it's just an ongoing thing. I can see see it happening, but if it's a one-time deal that where the school has to come back in two years and say, hey, we need to re-landscape this because all these are gone and have to spend X amount of dollars. <coughs> something to look at. It's, if it's something to say, hey, this if you have a class available, here's some funding for you to spruce this up a little bit to help with that. Mm -hmm. I'm just throwing thoughts out for mm -hmm. you guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, um, for the board, this is your first opportunity to hear about this in this kind of detail and to see kind of a diagram of it. Um, it's not an action item tonight. Um, we would bring it back to you in terms of making a decision on whether or not they could proceed. Um, it might be good if you have questions, um, you could uh, get those to me and I can forward them on to Teresa uh, and, and other people that might be involved with answering those. So. Yeah, I'd just like to see in more detail what Right, and Greg, like I said, he knew exactly what, you know, everything, yeah, everything was, you know, there's definitely the, you know, the path, the walkway, which would, yeah. you know, be through at the bench, um, you know, we'll have some flowering plants, um, you know, like I said, it's not that big, yeah, not big, that, not that big of an area, um, you know, uh, but I'm even having trouble picturing a bench in an arbor and all the plants in. I'm going to have to go there? back and look. There are two windows. Okay. Yes. I, I think yes. Yeah. I almost saw one. Yeah. yeah. There are two windows. Okay. Um, yeah. The bench. The. Well, the. Tr the trellis. Yeah. I mean, it looks like there's quite a bit, you know, um, in there. But I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, you know, a few bushes, a few, you know, grasses, a few flowering, you know, plants, but, um, yeah, write down your questions, because, you know, we want it to look nice, and we want it to look, especially in front of the, you know, in front of the school, which is very visible. Um, and you can each also uh, go there and view the area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can provide you hard copies of this, so you can have it. I think, I think the biggest thing is some kind of a commitment for maintenance. I don't, so, I don't have a problem with, with doing it at all, yeah. especially if there's no cost to the district. But I think the maintenance issue that... I think you approve it and you, and you say you're going to have to keep it maintained from a district standpoint. And what happens when you get really tight with funding and say, oh, we got $200 to spend on this to keep it up to the level? But I just I think there ought to be a maintenance part to it that the district didn't have to come up with that funds. Mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey, he he was a 4-H president at the time of the accident. And he left a lasting impression on a lot of our one, younger members, some of them seven, so that will be around 11, 12 more years. Um, I feel confident that 4-H would help maintain it, but as far as kicking the funds, like you say, to replace, 4-H doesn't have any money to spare. We got all kinds of labor. Exactly. No funds. Exactly. Well, I think if, if, if the people that are pushing this say, hey, we've got to have a kind of a maintenance fund for it, mm -hmm. then maybe we have it built in. Like if the Education mm -hmm. Foundation started, then we have, and we have that. People can get to the maintenance fund of that particular project if they want to mm -hmm. keep it. That's my mm -hmm. point Because if you have plants in there, you have a main, I mean, especially annual plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll have some native grasses, like you mentioned, but mm -hmm. you'll also have some, I would guess, some annuals. Right. And so you'll have maintenance. Yeah. A lot of the landscaping stuff will last quite a while. I know our landscaping in our home has been there eight or ten years, and, and we haven't had to do hardly anything. Mm -hmm. 
Father right. Yeah, to choose if things. If you're doing plants and things like that, that's going to be. And there's not a lot there, so you're not talking, like I say, $100. Mm -hmm. Maybe yours. Yeah. The service group comes in and wants to do that. Maybe they have 50 bucks they could bring in or whatever. I, maybe that's all it takes, $50. Mm -hmm. there, there would be annual. Well, why don't you take the opportunity in the next month to stop over there and take a look. We'll bring it back to you as an action item in November. Uh, they're not going to be doing much there in the interim anyway. So, um, you can have a decision. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next item that we have is capital report. Uh, the principals will be giving you numbers uh, in their building reports. Uh, the count day report, though, um, our uh, September 20 count was 301.5. Uh, that's not a head count. That's FTE or full-time equivalent. Um, the head count amount is actually about 515, I think. Um, kindergartners only count half. So that's why the number drops back. So last year, our September 20 count was through a 5.5. This year, it was through a 1.5. Um, that is unaudited. They'll still come out and, and audit it and make sure that those are all accurate numbers. And those sometimes change up and down one or two. Um, but that gives us a pretty good idea. That was close to what we had uh, set our budget on. I think that was on 310. And um, so that's less than what we set the budget on. However, we have more, uh, significantly more ESL uh, count than what we have. We budgeted for 90, and it's like 150 FTE uh, hours. Um, and also our vocational is up from what we had budgeted. So it'll be pretty close uh, to what we had budgeted. So questions about the count pay part? So we remain 1A? Yes, and Mr. Bergen, uh, and, I, and I know Mr. Bergen would apologize, uh, we have a double book tonight. Um, uh, have a J JV football game, uh, so he's up there. Um, he hopes to be here. Um, it started at 6, so he may be coming here just by any moment. Um, and he'll have a report on that. I think he has a handout for you on the classification part. We are one A. Steal this thunder, he'll, he'll explain how we ended up that way because it is kind of an interesting story. So. All right, we'll move on to the next item superintendent search brochure. We'll see uh, that on your desktop. And hopefully, you've had an opportunity to look at that. This is one of the things that Dr. Hahn talked about that we need to develop. He gave several samples. Um, I uh, also had others uh, that I could use as samples as well. <coughs> I pulled together one. Um, this is just a draft. I sent it to him to review. He didn't have any uh, suggestions. One thing, he had, actually, I see he no suggestions. He had a couple. One of them has to do with what we have in there um, in terms of application uh, information of things. It says application procedures. He said he will have a little bit of different information for a couple of those. Uh, it used to be that you actually uh, access the application online, filled it out online, but then you printed it out and mailed it. And I think it actually is completely online now. I think you fill it out on there and submit it. So, but he's wanting to get the language from KSB how that will be changed. But in essence, it's basically the same. Uh, the other correction or addition or change that he suggested was on the right hand side where it talks about timeline. Uh, I think the one I originally sent to you just said <coughs> January 16, 2012 as anticipated selection. Uh, he suggested that with the weather sometimes being unpredictable in that time of year, that we make it January 16th to 20th. It gives us a whole week in which 
you would have a board meeting somewhere in there uh, to make the determination. So, other than that, he thought it was great. Um, didn't have any other suggestions. Um, uh, we tried to put some graphics on there to to make it attractive. Um, we could try to do a little bit more in that area. What we would do is we would print this onto uh, cardstock. The, on the second page, that open section is where all of the mailing information would go into labels and stuff. So it simply fold and you put postage on it and go out. Um, so I would entertain discussion on the things about it you would like to see changed or tweaked. Does it pretty much meet the needs? One question I have is January 9th is the deadline and then the 11th interviews begin. Mm -hmm. Is that normally that close together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. They yeah. get this stuff. And yeah. They they will know uh, <coughs> most everyone because of the number of things that you have to submit. People will have all that stuff they're doing in advance. Okay. It would be pretty rare that you had somebody bring something in the 11th hour. It is possible, but they usually schedule the screening uh, to be like on day after the deadline. Okay. Um, so, uh, you can uh, modify that. No, no. That's no, just what I was just curious about it. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty, once once you start, it's a pretty quick process. Yeah, especially if we want to go visit one of the current employees. Right. And I think that also plays into what we have that freedom there in that whole week of when you're going to meet and stuff. So um, if you want to change any of those dates, that would be fine. And we can just contact up the line and visit about that. So. Any, any questions or comments or suggestions on any of this? I know it's going to be a busy time at the uh, on those dates, but I'm hoping that you guys will, especially when we begin the interviews that week, kind of say that's when interviews are going to occur and we need to be able to do those interviews. Uh, and that's, they're going to have to happen there. And he said he'd like to have all of us there. Is she giving free haircuts to anyone? I don't know about that. I can work on the hair. One thing that could impact uh, interviews, and this would depend on how many you want to interview. I think Dr. Hyman talked about, did he say three or five, maybe five at the tops, but about three maybe. Um, is there will be basketball going on uh, that you either work around or know that you're going to miss something. Um, the selection week there, 16th to the 20th, that corresponds with the Winter Classic, but the only uh, board duties would be um, to get together for a meeting to make a selection. Um, but getting into your question, if you want to go visit um, wherever it is, uh, that could enter in. Uh, so that would be something we could talk to them about, perhaps if we set uh, anticipated selection, I mean, we could stretch it to a two-week window uh, as far as that goes. But I know he's going to try to steer you into doing it in a pretty quick uh, process. One of the reasons for that is um, some of the applicants may already be uh, in positions and will have advisor boards, or at least some of the board members, that they are looking at doing this, and that could cause anxiety for other boards, and you don't want to stress that out any further than you have to, so um, that's why they do try to keep it compact. So. Well, that's 
from the group. I know I've got a couple of other things. Um, and that week is crazy around here. Is that what you need to do? Uh, like I said, he would probably steer you toward that, but um, we can share with him. You know, what are we doing in you know, a one week class? We could do it. Well, it's very possible we could be done by the end of be the 18th, or the 11th is, is that a Monday? It is. We could very well start to have it done by the Actually, it's a Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday. That's a year meeting all the way back here, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I guess. Would those be evening interviews? Yeah, the start at 6. The candidates will actually be here on site probably, uh, say starting up around 1 o'clock. Because they'll meet with district office staff, they'll meet with, there'll be a reception uh, probably immediately after school with all of the other district staff to meet with the candidates. Um, uh, probably a time to meet with the community as well. Some of that we can probably talk to you about. See that Monday, that Monday, isn't that a holiday? No, it was, I'm thinking the 16th. Oh, uh, that may be more than the 15th day, but we don't have all that now. I think we have well, I'm kind of just thinking if he's going to visit someplace on that Monday. I don't think. I mean, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm just thinking, should one week later, is that a bad thing? Just move everything one week. Talk to whoever. Well, I'm, I'm guessing do you want to go visit a place or can you visit the phone? Ninety percent of the ones I know do it over the phone, but if you want I didn't know how you did it. Everyone knew what was in their head, didn't they? Everybody wanted to go. <laughs> Midwinter Classic is the 16th through the 20th. Well, it actually starts the 17th. Yeah. It's 17th. Tuesday. You're real busy during that yes. midwinter. Well, there's other things yeah. involved in work mm -hmm. that week. Because it always conflicts. <laughs> so, that's... I'm, I'm hoping we're, we're progressed through there. And, I mean, it's like I say, I like to work fact they put the word anticipated there because what if you do run into a snag with an interview that you could work in with somebody and, and you could also share in yeah. the interview process and say yes it is anticipated and whether things can happen and stuff like that it just gives my an idea of the still more than yeah mm -hmm. uh, middle area classic is 17 19 20 and 21 but more than likely I would anticipate a couple things that if once we start interviews, I may delegate some interview, I mean some uh, calls out for some of you to follow up and instead of me making them all, maybe I may appoint if you make these two reference calls and give a report. Uh, I know it's the board president that needs to initiate. Those kind of things I may delegate to, to speed the process up a little bit. Um, in the my employer may frown and call in the middle of the class period. <laughs> but and making um, a visit, you won't have to do it during the day yeah. um, because otherwise you won't be able to do anything. And and that doesn't mean like if I don't know it depends on how far we don't know they may not be very far away they may be an hour it could be three hours away uh, could be five hours away and if they're five I'm probably not going to go listen for sure but the other thing is if it's an hour away somebody could go the next day and check the person out but I would say that more likely on because of from my experience you. Call references on it, everyone, not just one person. But that way you're not real biased. But 
what your answer is. In other words, wait, I'll wait until you guys make your selection and then I go call the references. I would call the references prior to them coming into the interview. That way you have information to share. Makes sense. Okay. I will I'll talk to Dr. Hyman and look at how we might tweak that anticipated selection date. We might post it as to the twenty first or something like that. And then in the interview process you can share how you know, weather permitting and other things it could go a little bit the next week. Are there any, is there anything else about the brochure? Second to approve the superintendent search brochure for mailing. Any further discussion? All in favor, right hand. 6 0. Thank you for your input. And this mailing, the list is generated. How? Where's what's the list? Um, they will provide us with the mailing labels and then we produce them. And any current out. superintendents on the list? Or? All uh, current school districts and I think all of the colleges of education that have a, an administrative program. And uh, principals too. Is it principals? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I went in there for principals. I mean, whoever can, whoever has a certificate yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. to do it. And that just the educational part, um, that there, just because you have a principal's license doesn't mean you have a district administrator's license. Yeah. Those are two different things, but they could have both. So, uh, but yeah, we'll just wait for the, the mailing list. Good question. And the um, question I have is, is it being posted on uh, what? Any type of uh, website? It'll be, on, it'll be on the KASB website, um, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I'll indicate that. And then also, each of the four surrounding bordering states, I think he said. Uh, but I don't know what, I think it's their equivalent of KASB, and also, then also their education, uh, state education websites as well. Mm -hmm. What about like the ESBAC? Um, it could be. I mean, if the board wants them to send out, they have <coughs> all all the folks that are members there also are would get it from KSD, so they can see it twice. But um, we can ask them to send it out. I'm just wondering if they may be a good ally in this because they spend a lot of time actually in the schools and probably mm -hmm. even more so than KSD, and probably have some good insights as to I don't know what what kind of. Do they have culture, do they post different job administrators or cultures? They don't, they don't have anything on their website as far as posting job openings except what they have internally. Um, but they have a list, uh, email list so they can send it out to folks. So people can see it twice then. So I think they don't mind doing that. I'm just checking if they have a problem. They might have a policy against it, but they yeah. could. All right, no further questions. We'll move on to number four, which is uh, policy updates, first read. And for you that, that haven't been here before on policy updates, we have first and second readings, and then we have adoption. That's right. We would present, we're presenting it to you today, tonight for first reading is strictly information. Uh, and then at the next meeting, we would bring it to you again for second reading and um, proposed approval. Um, KESB sends us out uh, policies as suggestions to update. It is strictly voluntary. We would not have to do this, but they're trying to be proactive to help us be covered by uh, things. For example, we already have each of these three policies in our policy book, um, but they have um, uh, some small changes that they're suggesting that uh, we would adopt. 
the first one, policy GAAD, relates to child abuse, where we have posters or a policy about that, but we don't have posters. Um, and so what this would, policy would involve would be us posting the 800 number around the buildings um, for people to know where to call to report child abuse. Um, and all teachers, all educators are mandatory reporters of child abuse. And our channel to do that is local law enforcement. What we're actually now is an 800 number. And so that's what we're promoting, that that be posted in visible locations uh, that we can call to report that. So, um, we may have a few of the posters around, but we're looking to put a few more up um, if we can be visible. So that would be the change on that one. On JRB, which is releasing student records, um, one, the, the, it all relates to FERPA, which is our Family Educational Records Protection Act. We have to provide that notice every year. We do that in our August newsletter. Uh, we also have them listed on our website uh, under the federal forms uh, tab. Um, the main change here is um, the protecting of the student's social security number. So they're saying make sure that none of the records that we give out have students' social security numbers unless it's going to another educational institution. Um, currently, um, the kids program, the, the Kansas information demographic stuff on students that we do, there actually is a slot in there for social, social security number, but we do not send that to the state um, just because they, they don't have a reason for having it, and yet they still put it on there. And they, they make it optional, but why they have it in there, I don't know. So, uh, but we would, that would be the change for us to have that policy that we don't put that in. So. And then finally, the last one, KGD. Um, it's called Crowd Control Activities. Um, the specific part that is changed in that is um, when you go into our buildings, uh, most instances you'll see there's a sign that says no firearms. Um, and apparently it's been an issue in some schools um, because Kansas now they have a concealed carry permit. And some schools have encountered people bringing their firearm into the school. So the change in this policy would be to prohibit, make it illegal for any person other than law enforcement to have a, a firearm in or on any school property, school grounds, or any district building or structure. Do we have the authority to do something illegal? Um, that's the language that KDSP gave us. Uh, I mean, it strikes me that that's a, not, it's a, a curious term to me because yeah. it sounds to me like well, we have, we have the rules but not law. Yeah. But um, um, Billy's got to get a home that, I mean, that he could take apart. And could he refinish that in shop or not? Um, if it's just, if let it's me not, call and check on it. I, if you were if you were to take it apart, remove the fire. I would say it's a double throw and it's just like the back stock or something. Oh, like that. to bring the stock in? Well, it'd have the stock in it, but it wouldn't have the barrel with it. Uh, uh, can you take the, the firing mechanism out of it, like the pin, firing pin? I don't know if you want to be able to. Yeah, if it's you can smart, do that. Yeah, I mean, if you can do that, it's no longer a firearm. Okay. So, you know, we could do that. But we want to make sure that um, we take some precautions when he brings it in and we restore it and stuff like that. Because even just seeing the end of the, the stock of the yeah. firearm could get people wound up. No, I'm just, I was just curious if that was. You must be in Kansas <laughs> when this subject comes up. Well, I think you need to make sure. Because it well, just, I'm not even going to do it if it's going to come I, yeah. Yeah. I have a yeah. this question. He can do it. It just takes one way. person that's not against firearms to press the issue, and then you're up the creek. Because then you have to go back and. and I mean, I do know that have done enough with firearms. I mean, if he wants to do it, I mean, it's not that difficult to take the, the recoil reducer off, and he can just. The stock from the whole. Mm -hmm. you know, there's just a. Uh, not yeah, back I agree. But I'll call KSB also. Um, and the idea of people 
you know, being concerned about it. My son had an interesting experience. He's attending at uh, Hutch Community College and walked into the science building over there. Uh, I don't know, it was last week or the week before. It was one of those days when it was kind of chilly in the morning. He has a leather coat that probably hits about mid-thigh. Uh, he walked in and the person at the reception desk said, we need to have you take your coat off. And he was just kind of like, why? Because we, we want to make sure you're not carrying a, some sort of firearm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the memories of Columbine mm -hmm. are still fresh for people. So, um, so we'll take precautions and check. Anyway, so those are for first first reading, and we will bring them back to you again in November for second reading and approval. If you have questions about them, you can ask now or hold questions to me. Questions? Comments? Good. All right. We'll move on to communications. And we'll start with the board member activities and reports. Stan? I've done nothing since the last time we were here. <laughs> that was about a week ago. No. <laughs> Carol? No. Okay. I really haven't done anything. I've attended a few athletic events and volleyball games and stuff. So what's, the, what's the public, since you brought that up, what's the public perception of the bleachers? I think I've heard good comments where where, I, where I've been sitting by people. I mean that's that's all I've heard that they like that. I think they wish they would have put backs on the <laughs> south side. Some of the junior high games they were only pulling the bleachers out on the south side, and they didn't have backs on them. But I think they did pull some out on the north and had some backs. On them. Yeah. Do you have a comment too? Yeah. <laughs> is, that your, is that the heart? <laughs> I had it in my pocket. I apologize. That's all right. Uh, I actually, I don't have anything because uh, we had a meeting when South Central Special Ed had their meeting, so I wasn't able to get from there. Um, while we're on member activities, um, are any of you planning to attend the regional meeting? This week, Dodge City. Okay. That was what, this coming Wednesday. Yeah. Really, it's going to be a pretty good slate of speakers there. So, and uh, according to Dr. Kenworthy, the governor's office is going to be represented there. If not the governor, uh, somebody from the office uh, and about their uh, educational finance, so forth. A lot of new things coming down the pike that are going to drastically change that. So, um, I will be attending this all day. Yes? I do have one thing that I just thought of. Mm -hmm. On that note of legislative stuff. Um, I've been getting um, correspondence from the state of Kansas um, relating to the activity of the Office of the Repealer, which was something that um, the Brownback Administration has initiated to um, reduce regulatory burden is kind of how they're characterizing it. So they're taking comments right now. In fact, there's a hearing tomorrow. I, I don't know how formal a hearing it is or if it's a listening session, but both in Great Bend and Pratt. Um, and they're taking comments on anything. It could be anything. It could be anything relating to the way we manage our school. It could be transportation oriented. It can be, you know, food oriented, anything. They're wanting to look here what <coughs> what kind of um, regulations or laws would, um, if repealed, allow us to manage our businesses better, our institutions, um, you know, increase business, the like. So, do you have anything, you know, in that range of unfunded mandates that are unreasonable mandates put on us that if we were released from might allow us to, um, you know, not have to expend school resources on something we don't think is necessary? This is our time to talk. Since I have other 
options for submitting stuff like online or something? Uh, you know, I, I'm part of. I'm, I plan to go as much as anything to also kind of get a good lay for the lay of the land because, I mean, obviously the legislative session doesn't start mm -hmm. for a few months. I don't know. So uh, I'll try like to figure out a little more about how. It, mm -hmm. What's that? There was an article on that paper mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I didn't get notice on these particular meetings until it was either Thursday or Friday last week. There wasn't a lot of advance notice. Okay. Any other reports? We'll go to administrative reports. We'll start with elementary principal. Um, my K-6 count is 155 and right now we're serving 25 in preschool. So K-6 is 155 and in preschool, and as Dr. Kenworthy said, that's headcount, and those numbers don't all get uploaded into kids as our kids, but those are the children that are coming to our building every day. Um, we've been doing a lot, and uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight a few things. Last week, we had the reading roundup event, and Christy Snyder gave me the 251 readers, so that includes the students and grandparent, parent, or their partner who came to the reading roundup to read. Friends of the Library provided the treats um, for that event, and it, it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of happy kids and adults in our building on Friday, so that was neat. Um, we are continuing our Fresh Fruits and Vegetables grant, and since the beginning of school, we've been serving uh, kindergarten through fourth grade students either a fresh fruit or vegetable every afternoon as a snack through that grant. Um, it's been, been going very well, kind of sticky at times. Um, had celery a few times, and that was <laughs> tough for some kids, but um, I think it's going very well. Um, coming up in October, we have a really busy October. Um, I know of at least three guest speakers that are coming in during the month. Um, uh, at least three different class field trips during the month and four what I call events that are multi-class, volunteer um, uh, things going on in our school. So. Let me know if you feel like volunteering or being involved in anything going on in our school, and I will find you a job. So, just let me know. Anyway, um, and today was Miss Clausen's first full day in second grade, and I visited with her, and it's a good day. So, any questions for me? Thank you for your report. Ms. Morgan must have gotten delayed. I kind of expecting that he'd sit down right there and make it all the time or what. But um, the one thing I know he was wanting to report on, and he has um, some sheets that uh, we'll get to, uh, was about uh, our classification. Classification changed this year. Um, used to be that the top three grades, that number was submitted to the Kansas State High School Activity Association, and that determined what classification you were in. Uh, they've expanded that is now the top four grades in high school that they do. So, um, uh, and we were very, very close. Um, we had 99 that we submitted. There were four schools in the state that had 99. Two of them ended up in 2A, and two ended up in 1A. Uh, the tiebreaker on it was how many kids did you submit last year? So the two schools that had the higher number submitted last year went to 2A. Um, those were Opie and Little River. Uh, Opie, if you remember, that's who we played in the championship in volleyball. Uh, and uh, the two that stayed in line were um, St. John and Jet Moore. So, um, one of the other, for those of you that are keeping track of this kind of stuff, uh, as far as volleyball goes, one of the other schools that has uh, locally kind of pressed us uh, is Pratt Skyline and 101 students. So we ended up in two A. The number of students that um, a classification is defined by changes year to year based on the number of enrollment right. in different mm -hmm. and all yeah, it's schools. total number of kids. That's not number of kids in an activity. That's total kids enrolled in those grades. 
Football is still determined every two years, and that's based upon the first three grades, freshman, sophomore, junior. Um, and we are in the second year of that, I believe. Uh, they'll be going for scheduling on Wednesday. Uh, so Nick Garcia and Mr. Burton will be in Salina at the Bicentennial Center. Uh, it's basically like a stampede. You can imagine every school district is going to be there trying to fill their schedule. So, um, Close the 1A schools small, or do they have fewer 1A schools now? We have two yeah. divisions. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew they had two divisions. Yeah. I have them last year, but is there less schools in those two divisions? Oh, combined? No. Yeah. Uh, well, no, there would be because we have uh, six nice. or seven school, fewer school districts now. Mm -hmm. Like Clovera Heights and Clapham went together, and I believe they're 2A their head count. So there would be a, there's probably six or seven fewer One schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I didn't know what the count all four grades were that made four and two grade schools. And yeah. One and one. They start at the top and there's yeah. 32 6A schools, then there's 48, 5A, 4A, 3A, 2A. Some of them are 64. 62. Yeah. 64. Top yeah. two has 32. And then there's talk of trying yeah. to, uh, in 4A, there's such a big discrepancy, they're splitting, they're talking about splitting that, but whether that will happen. Yeah. We, have, we currently have seven divisions. There's two divisions in 1A, so it's a total of seven, and they're talking about creating another division and splitting 4A. So they're having 64 in some of those categories, and only have 48. And some schools are above, some schools are down. We are on October 22nd. Uh, we're hosting Sub State. And it's so. actually here it's in actually Canada. Here. Mm -hmm. You go on the website, we have a, a little piece on there, and it tells you, it lists all the schools uh, that are in there with us. So. And if the girls make it to state, will they still go to Hayes? Or yes. Okay. So the both one of Still go to Hayes. Okay. That's correct. Um, if you're looking for something, uh, for some physical fitness and some fun um, on Wednesday in this right, this is the International Walk to School Day. If you'd like to come join the kids, I think at 8.05, they're leaving from, is that leaving from school? Is that when they're going to be at the park? No, that's when we'll be leaving school. Yeah, just to get the kids walk around the square and back to school. So a lot of our kids walk already, but um, for those that don't, it's kind of a fun experience for the community. Are you going to walk to school? Am I going to walk to school? I don't know. I might just start now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want her to walk by your house? Do you walk to? Yeah, you walk with her when she comes by. Yeah, you oh, pick me up house. on the way. You can pick Billy up on the way. <laughs> <laughs> also on October 5th, um, and this is one that uh, Mr. Cornwall set up for us, uh, for the staff, we're going to have a health fair from 7 to 8 a.m. And all those staff that we wanted to could go in and um, I think it cost them $30 to get a bank of tests run that normally run not quite $400 to get. So, and uh, kind of helps our staff keep thinking about how they can be healthier and also keeping track of what things they may or may not be doing right. So, um, that'll be Wednesday. Um, um, Administratively, uh, two building principals uh, have been working on what's called the Principal's Building Report. Um, it's data that the state collects on a whole variety of things. Um, there is a new item on there uh, that Ms. Seif has got to help figure out. Um, they've now started asking what is our building capacity. Um, they're wanting to know how many kids can your building educate. And so what we did is we just took all the classrooms, whether it's actually being used as a classroom right now, and we multiplied it by 25. It's just kind of a ballpark guess. Um, I think they're wanting to know because I think there's questions that are being asked in the legislature, you know, because some schools are building new buildings and things like this. And um, I think 
there's some that I'm looking at. Is that necessary? In some cases, whether they just building new buildings, they want new buildings, or do they actually need the capacity? So, um, all of that then feeds into a report that we do in the district office called the SO66, which is the superintendent's organization report. So, um, all of those things have to be completed by the end of so, But I think we're about done on most all of them. So. Um, the last thing I have, unless you have questions about something, uh, I know Mr. Woodward has gone by. The auditorium seats in the center section have been realigned. Uh, three rows have been removed and they've all been respaced. Um, <clears throat> it worked out a little bit better than what we had uh, anticipated that it would. Uh, we had said that we gained about four to five inches. With that, we gained about six inches. That much. That much. Just that much. much. Um, it is. At least leg room wise, it's very, very nice. Um, and when you walk in, unless you know, your first walk in and look, you wouldn't notice it. I mean, if you start looking around, then you'll figure it out. Because um, as you walk down the aisle and look out across, you can see the ones on the sides are packed pretty tight. So um, we're still hoping to have the whole project done by the musical. Um, as I shared the information with you, the, company contacted us that's doing the cushion things, um, and the fabric fire had a fire, um, so, but they're still saying that they think they can get it to us in three weeks, and that would give us about two and a half, three weeks to get it installed, so um, we'll see. Uh, what we may do is go through and install all the seat cushions for sure, and then the time permitting do the, the back cushions. But I think that's that's going to be a really nice improvement for the folks that are going to do Now, on an airplane, your uh, first class seats is the front row or in front of the plane. Uh -huh. You have more leg room. But at the auditorium, uh -huh. it's the last row that is the extra leg room. You know, there's out there there's much one more. row, the very last yeah. row, we could have adjusted to match all the others, but would have created about an eight inch gap between the support poles uh, for the light booth and the back of the seats and we decided just to leave the seats where they were because it would just encourage people to try to squeeze through there and they'd break the seats and stuff like that. So if you want a lot of leg room, go for that one. This is Almost enough room there that you can bring your footstool and put your feet up. It's not like the room for parents with kids who need to exit. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> there's, 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 there's going to be search for this. Pay me, pay me, I will be there. Yes. Um, and actually, getting in and out would be yeah, much easier for everybody because yeah. there wasn't any way to get out once people stood up. I think for the most part, you'd probably be able to get in and out if people have not people have to stand up. So. Yeah. And I see that Mr. Bergen has arrived. I already stole your thunder, Mr. Bergen. I told him about the. 1A stuff, but I didn't know. Did you have a handout for them? Or? Oh, I just made the classification. I just printed out the classifications yeah. if they wanted. If you have that. They can have that, yeah. Do yeah. you have any, anything else to report, such as ball game score or anything like that? Yeah, oh, yeah. It was an exciting JV game. We lost 51 to 44. Huh. Yeah, we came down to the last minute. Was, Who were we playing? Uh, Fairfield. To give you a little background on Mr. Bergen's looking at stuff there, we played Fairfield Bear varsity uh, last Friday. Uh, it was 52 to 6. We were done five minutes into the third quarter. They only have two seniors, I think. Yeah, three. I think oh, three on the program. Yeah, so they brought everybody. And so uh, it was kind of like play, almost like playing them all over again with our JV. Yeah, I just printed out the. Uh, Pages there of the uh, classifications. If you have any questions about anything, uh, has the eighth grade always been that small? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of lost kids. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm trying to. I'm like not sure class exactly class in elementary. Up last year, I thought. It had 20, maybe it had 20 or so, 21 last year. It might have had more than that when it was in elementary. Yeah. Let's, um, do you remember, Mr. Burton, what's the cutoff for Division 2? 
Yeah, I think if Division Two goes, Division One's 99 to 59, and then Division Two is 58 to 25. Perfect. Yeah. I'm just trying to look ahead to next year. <clears throat> that eighth grade class come in. Oh, yeah, we yeah we would we would I, I, or Division One. Division will always be Division One, but we right, yeah. might be on the bubble about one A or two A. And this, that's only for classification. Football is different because football goes every two years. And, you know. I told them you were going to go have a party on Wednesday. Yeah, hopefully we'll have a, at least have a schedule. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else on this slide at all you can think of? Um, just a reminder that the board meeting on for November is... Um, and that I will be out of the office with the China delegation from the second to the eleventh. So, if you have any things you want me to look for or um, ask questions about, um, I'm just now starting to get the information about itinerary and stuff like that. So um, we're going to get to visit a lot of the schools there and both elementary, secondary, as well as college, so um, hoping to make some connections there, both for possibility, you know, we'd, we'd be able to do some sort of internet Mandarin language class, for example, or just uh, sharing things back and forth between teachers, partnerships that way, um, and even keep my ears open for any kind of economic development options. Being an agricultural society here primarily, um, maybe there's some connections there uh, we can make in that way. So I'll be listening for those things as well. Okay. Um, executive session items, personnel. Does any staff have anything? I don't have any items. I know you don't have anything. Uh, no board members, so there is no executive session. Um, I would entertain a motion to have a resignation here. Okay, any motion for adjournment then? Nothing else is brought forward. Do we just get up and leave or at this time do we make a motion? Mr. President, I need to adjourn the meeting. Good, thanks to adjourn all. Okay, right hand.